Welcome to the show. Well, this was a fun one. Obviously, my show has had a lot of musicians on, and I think I will always have them on, but it's also nice to mix it up every now and then. And today I have an author slash journalist slash UFO researcher, Mr. Ryan Sprague. He's been researching UFOs for a very, very long time. His book here is called Somewhere in the Skies, and it's a collection of eyewitness accounts of UFOs and alien encounters, and many of them are not very well known. So it's a fascinating book, and we're just going to scratch the surface of it today. He also has a podcast of the same name as his book, uh, Somewhere in the Skies, where he goes into more detail on some of these cases, and he talks about a lot of other cases. Uh, He's also appeared on CW's Mystery Decoded show for two episodes, one about Area 51 and one about Roswell. Um, He's been in some other TV shows as well, so we'll talk about all that, plus some of the other most famous UFO and alien abduction cases on record. I found all this stuff very fascinating, and I hope you do too. Uh, A little tip for this episode, if you hear us talking about something and you want to explore more about that later, uh, remember, I have timestamps in the show notes on every topic that we discuss, so you can follow along. If you're wondering, what was that thing they were talking about? Just check the show notes. It'll probably be in there. All right, enjoy. Welcome, Ryan Sprague, to the Chuck Shoe Podcast. How are you doing? Good, man. Thank you for having me. I've uh, I've caught up on a lot of your episodes, and there are a few that uh, really? <laughs> I really like, man. I've heard that you are like the king of doing research, so I had to do the same. Okay. And uh, I actually just finished listening to uh, your episode with um, uh, was uh, Chris from Less Than Jake, I believe. Oh, was. I was going to ask if you, yeah, because like yeah. I, I know you're a Green Day fan, so I thought maybe you'd like that one. I like that one, and then um, your your one with uh, uh, ah, well, Everclear. What's his name? Oh, Art. Art. Whoa, dude, that oh, was that an was, interesting. That interview. was an interesting <laughs> one. Yeah, it's uh, that's like I only had two people that kind of were kind of like that to me. A uh, hundred and fifty over hundred and fifty episodes. So it was, that one was especially weird. He was just like, okay, like, and I and looking back, I kind of go, yeah, maybe I should have like steered the conversation when people only give you 20, 30 minutes. You got to maybe just make it a casual. And I think that's all he wanted. He just wanted a casual conversation yeah. about his to promote his tour. He didn't want to do an in depth history life, you know, right. life story, which I think his story is really inspiring, but maybe he was sick of telling it. So it, it's hard, dude. Yeah. Like I've been there. I do interviews weekly and like you, you end up having like 10 sheets of inter- of questions and then you get to like six of them. Right. You never know where the yes. conversation is going to go. So yeah. I feel you. But um, I'm, I'm so. I think it's awesome. You put it out as is. Cause like, I, I know a lot of podcasters that wouldn't do that. Like when I first started, man, I was editing every, um, uh, every breath, every yeah. like, thing out of it. And now I'm just like, fuck it. I yeah. <laughs> That's what happened to me. I just, my, my thing was, uh, I just want to, I know I don't have time to edit the ums and ahs. I'd rather focus on the next episode. And with the, cu- the couple of bad episodes I have, I just thought, well, I want to get people's feedback and maybe they, they still think I did a good job. Maybe they think it was the guest's fault or maybe there's something I did wrong and I want to learn from that. So I just figure I look at it like a learning experience. I figure in two, three, yeah. five years, I'll look back at those and go, oh my God, like I'm so much better. <laughs> I hope so. If I listen to my first episode, man, now I think I would like, oh, it'd be so cringe. Uh, yeah. God, I don't even remember when that was, but yeah, no, thank you. That's my long winded way of saying thank you for having me. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, thank you for being on the show. So yeah, just like real quick before we dive into the book and all the uh, UFO stuff, uh, I did find interesting. Uh, you talked about your playwriting days and uh, you, you did, what, explain that you wrote plays when you were in New York city. I mean, you're, the, you're in New York still now, but did you go to school for that or? Yeah. So, um, you got I, a little so, blurry, by the way. Oh, there we go. Oh, did I? Yep, okay. You're back. Okay. Um, it's a pretty weird trajectory. I actually started as a uh, a baseball player, like from t-ball up to college. I played baseball, and I really you know, I went to school. Yeah, I went to college my first year, played a little, and then uh, I caught the acting bug. Man, I did mm. I did a couple plays in like high school. You know, you got to up those extracurriculars to look good on college applications okay. and uh and i loved it so when i got to school i it was kind of a um a dueling life of baseball and in the arts and the arts took over man i uh became an actor a, a uh i'd always written i'd written you know comic books and stuff as a kid and uh short stories and um then when i decided to get into theater i'm like oh let me give playwriting a try see if i could you know, create these worlds of the characters that I was uh, ostensibly playing. And um, 
it took off, man. I, I love the writing. Uh, and I moved to New York City and became the cliche struggling artist. And uh, it's gone pretty good so far. I've, yeah, um, one of your plays was yeah. adapted into a movie. The, so the one Reach or whatever, it was... Yeah, it's yeah. Cool. So I, I wrote Reach, a two-person play, which was a exercise for me. Because, you know, who wants to watch just two people on a on a stage for like two hours? Um, so it has to be very dynamic. It has to be very, you know, powerful. And And why are you in a character's life in that moment? Why are we being dropped into their life. Um, and that was kind of the playwriting one-on-one lesson is something's got to change in your character's life for us to like want to care about this. And uh, mm. for Reach, that was it, man. It was um, people struggling with the aftermath of uh, tragedy and coming out on the other side of it. Um, and I kind of used the backdrop of Hurricane Katrina, which was uh, two years prior, uh, excuse me, after mm. I'd written the play. I was in New Orleans and I met a woman at a bus stop there when I was visiting. And um, she told me her whole story, how she lost her, her uh, brother in Hurricane Katrina. And uh, for her, she found like, you know, hope and faith in the church. And I, I was like, that's pretty interesting. So um, I told her, thank you for sharing that. And then eventually I went back to New York and I wrote almost a whole play kind of based around this woman's shared story with me. So whoever she is, wherever she is, wow. I, I have her to thank for probably my most successful play and now movie uh, to date. Yeah, that's exciting. And so, and I bring that up because that influences how you wrote the book. You, you, you took a, a cue from your playwriting days and, you know, you focused on people and their experiences. You, you don't go into a lot of technical scientific jargon in this book and stuff. You're more interviewing all these people. And also you interview people that so a lot of these stories have not been told these are not the most famous cases. These are some ones that have maybe not had as much attention. Yeah, I'm glad you picked up on that. You know, when I got into the quote unquote UFO field, as I'm sure we'll get to, um, like everyone's heard of Roswell, right. New Mexico crash or what have you. And uh, when I really got heavy into UFOs, I was like, what can I do to kind of shake this community up or uh, this research field? Uh, and um do something different. So I thought, Hey, I'm going to focus on the people. Like, you know, I, I saw something I couldn't explain when I was a kid and I knew there were other people out there who had those experiences as well, whether it's a UFO or, you know, maybe a supernatural experience or something that shifted the reality in that moment. And, um, so I went around the country and I interviewed people in all walks of life and, uh, belief systems and, uh, took down their stories, man. And, recorded them, put them in a book and got their voices out there. Like you said, many for the very first time ever. So I, I commend anyone who's willing to go on the record, use their real name and talk about this really weird shit that's uh, becoming more and more, I think, accepted in our world now. So yeah, yeah, it was a rewarding experience. For sure. So you talk about, that's the first chapter of the book is that, you know, the catalyst is Talk about your experience. I know you've told this story probably a million times, but if you could tell my audience your UFO story, you saw something when you were 12. Yeah, totally, man. I, um, like, oh man, you do your research. I love it. I know everyone <laughs> brings that up with yeah. you, but I, I really, I don't get to talk about these things often, to be honest. So um, with the UFO sighting itself, it was um, 1995 and uh, I was fishing off a dock at a motel in uh, central New York. And um, that's what I did. Like my parents and I would go on kind of weekend trips to, to these places up in the Thousand Islands, they call it, up here in upstate New York. And uh, I loved just fishing and listening to music. And uh, I know at that time it was probably, it was Green Day. I know specifically I was listening to Dookie. When in, a man, right? is what... in a disc man, right? In a disc man, dude. <laughs> like, 95, that brings us back. And it was Basket Case. I know the exact song when this UFO um, event happened. So yeah, I saw a reflection in the water. Uh, I thought something was in the water. So I like get down and I'm kind of looking and I'm like, oh, it's a reflection. Um, so <laughs> I look up and there it was, man. It was just uh, these white lights in a perfect triangular formation and um, kind of like a red light in the middle. It's kind of what a lot of these, a lot of people call the prototypical triangular UFO. Um, or a black triangle they're known as. And, uh, but I didn't see like a machine. I always make that clear. I didn't hmm. see like windows or aliens or anything like that. I saw a perfect equilateral triangle of lights and it just was floating above me. 
and it was completely quiet. Even if, if it were some sort of aircraft, it made no noise whatsoever. And at wow. that point, I'd actually like flip my headphones off and because I wanted to see if I could hear anything, right. what the hell was going on. And I could still hear Green Day on the headphones and I could hear the water hitting the dock. And that was it. And I uh, kind of just watched that those lights float over the water. And um, eventually I was able to yell for my dad. He was in the motel watching a Yankees game. And uh, like nothing gets him away from baseball. And I know the feeling he uh, that's kind of what he conditioned me as as well. But I finally got him to come out, man. And he actually saw it with me. So I knew I wasn't crazy. I knew I wasn't like making shit up or like over exaggerating because he saw it too. And he was like, what the the hell is that? And I'm looking at him like, yo, dad, tell me what's going on here. You're the parent. Yeah. And he couldn't. He and couldn't. then didn't you guys also ask the motel clerk and, and he was like, yeah, there's been UFO reports. Yeah. So, you know, again, I wasn't into UFOs before that. So I didn't know, like, what do you do in these situations? Do you like call the police? Do you, yeah. what do you do? You call like the, the military. Um, so we kind of, after the event happened, um, I should mention the lights went over the water and disappeared. And we were like, all right, that just happened. Um, it really affected me. Like, really affected hmm. me my dad not so much um did it we scare you did you have nightmares or anything or yeah oh. totally man. i had um i had nightmares for years like i was hoping maybe they would just go away but i'm telling you like every dream i had if it was outside like there it was i was seeing those fucking lights wow. like no matter where i was what was going on in the dream they were there and um it really messed with my head for a long time but um yeah like you said we talked to the motel owner and we're like what is that was that like a blimp or like what what's going on here we saw something he's like well i don't know what you're talking about specifically but yeah like this is an active area for ufos and that was kind of the first time i'd ever heard the term ufo i didn't know Hmm. that this was a thing i i was just like what the hell am i looking at and um yeah like you said nightmares 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 and then uh, that's when I got really into it. Dude. Crazy. Like I, <laughs> so I yeah. So obsessed. if we go through some of these ca- case examples in the book, like I remember even the second chapter, um, you interview this kid, Damien, and this is one, another one of those, I'm reading the story and going, this is crazy. And I've never heard of this one before, but I think what's interesting about this one is the kid, he, he saw a light orb and he kept seeing it. Like it wasn't just a one-time thing. That's kind of unusual, isn't it? It is, you know, often UFOs are a very singular event um, Mm -hmm. and they're gone in the blink of an eye but they leave lasting impressions which is again what the book is all about but for damien man you're right um this was in i believe sydney or right outside sydney australia and um he was a skateboarder he was skating home one night um with his friends he didn't want to be late for dinner and get in trouble so he's bolting home and um he looks behind him and he sees this orb like following him (laughs) what is going on he, he had no idea what it was, what he was looking at. And every time he'd like speed up on his skateboard, it would speed up following. When he'd stop, the light would stop. And he was terrified. He's like, what the hell is going on? And he finally gets home, tells his mom. They go outside. There's nothing there. She thinks he's making it up. He's a kid, overactive imagination. But then these orbs started appearing all the time to him um, outside their home. Eventually his mom uh said yeah they were there and uh on camping trips um for years these orbs would keep following this dude his brother saw it his cousin his dad and um you know he kind of became like a local celebrity he was like the orb guy and all these australia news stations started coming out and interviewing him like to the point man where they were in in the middle of an interview orb show and all these news reporters are like what the fuck is going on? Is this on video or? I don't know. Okay. I have yet to see an actual video of a news broadcast that he claims that happened, but mm. I wouldn't put it past him. Hmm. Um, I've had so many people vouch for this guy. And whenever they're in his presence in Australia, something happens. So like, what do you do with that? You know, these things are following you throughout yeah. your life. They well, clearly have some interest in you as an individual. So that it is, affected him greatly. That's yeah, it's really bizarre. And that's one, one of the themes I've, I've I noticed in the book was 
because when people think of like UFO sightings, they think of like the stereotype is like some redneck, you know, some drunken guy out fishing or something. But it's like, no, a lot of these people like this next guy, uh, Scott, is it Scott? Is it Santa? Is that how you say his last name? Santa. Scott yep, Santa. Yep. His guy was a Coast Guard with top secret clearance. And this was one of the ones that in your book that, that uh, amazed you the most was that he saw this because he saw this giant UFO over a drive-in movie theater. And he says everyone else in the drive-in movie theater saw it, but nobody spoke of it. And he drove home and it wasn't until years later, like the memory was triggered. That's so yes. bizarre. But so it's, none of those other people, I mean, only you found one person that came forward after that, that says she was in the same town and corroborated the story. Yeah. I'm, I'm so happy you brought up that follow-up to this because in, um, I should be, I guess, more clear. I wrote a book in 2016. Mm. Uh, this was pre, you know, all this New York times, UFO Pentagon stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, Scott was, a focal point of one of my chapters, that story, like you said, this happened at a drive-in movie theater, um, big black Delta shaped craft, no lights, no appendages, no nothing just floated over this drive-in messed with the electricity there. Nobody's car engines would start. So it was like close encounters of the third kind. And, and nobody um, panicked and that's what's so, nobody, and then nobody remembered it. It's almost like it yeah. brainwashed people or something, or I don't get it instant amnesia dude it, it's so weird yeah scott even said he went he like this happened the thing floated over the drive-in parking lot he said tip to tip it covered the whole parking lot it was huge silent and then disappeared in a field lights come back on people's cars start but nobody left and nobody was freaking out or talking about this huge craft over them people were just getting their popcorn going back in the car the movie starts Scott gets in his car with his buddy. They watch the movie, drops his friend off, and they never talk about it again. And then, like you said, something just clicked in his head one day. He saw like a book with a UFO on it, and all these memories came flooding in. And of course, dude, I'm like, I'm not, I don't just take these stories at face value. I dig and I do try to corroborate the stories, find other witnesses, and nothing. No articles in the local newspapers about this happening. Um, you know, no. I, I obviously tried to find the drive-in. It's not there anymore. You know, this happened in 1974. Mm -hmm. But um, like you said, what is going on with these UFOs that it's able to like click our brains on and off? I can't pretend to have an answer, but um, that case, it really stuck with me because of that aspect to it. And we've even heard things like that with uh, people who saw the Phoenix Lights incident, this famous incident of 1997. That, yeah, here in um, Phoenix. That's where I live. Exactly, dude. Yeah. Uh, did you see it? No, I, see I was in Seattle no. at the time. So I moved okay. I moved here in 2007, 2008. So yeah, yeah, my girlfriend, I think, I don't know if she saw it, but I know she remembers it being a big thing. So Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah it was it was huge. I mean, even the governor of uh, right. Arizona, Fife Simonton, saw it. And um, thousands of people witnessed these lights in Phoenix. And a lot of them said that like they saw it. And then it was kind of just like, I forgot about it and I never talked about it again. So I don't know what it is, man, but there seems to be some sort of emotional control and mental control over witnesses who see some of these things, or it's literally their brain can't process what's going on. And it's like, let's just tuck that back in the vault for now and not worry about it. So I can't pretend to have an answer. Well, but yeah, that's I'm hearing more and more of those cases. Yeah, that's interesting. So, you know, because in chapter five, you talk this guy, uh, Kieran Woodhouse. So he saw these black triangles, massive, sleek, glossy, and, uh, you know, him and his brother, I think they both saw him and they, and they cried and he ended up becoming a researcher. And, uh, you know, this was part that was uh, really interesting to me was he talks about the phenomenon and that, uh, you know, maybe they're not, we're not seeing things correctly. Like we can only see roughly, uh, 0.05% of the light spectrum. So he's saying you have to question what is in the existing in the 99.95% of the light spectrum that we can't see or interact with so he's like doing all this research on that like can you explain that further though i don't know if i, I even understand that we're only seeing 0.05 percent of the light right so again I, I you know i'm no scientist or anything like that chuck i wish but <laughs> um the way he described it to me is that we can only process so much with um the parts of the brain that we use our comprehension our perception seems to play a big role in all of this, as I'm sure 
we'll get to. There's other people in my book who were there at the same time looking at something, but described it completely differently, which is super freaky mm-hmm. and really cool. But um, like you said, with him, him and his brother had completely different reactions. Brother was kind of like, oh, that's pretty cool. Like, this is awesome. Like, UFO, game on. And meanwhile, he is like in the driver's seat, falling his eyes out, like terrified, in awe, has no idea how to control his emotions at that time, looking at this thing. And like you said, um, a lot of these UAP, as we're calling them now, aerial phenomena, unidentified aerial phenomena, uh, which I actually enjoy more than UFO, so much baggage and history with that term. <laughs> sure. So I think um, his experience really shows that we're not just dealing with some sort of craft in the sky or, um, you know, it, there's many things going on when it comes to phenomena. And I think what right. he's trying to say is sometimes we can't even perceive everything by looking at this object. It's just too far advanced and, uh, to be honest, too strange. Yeah. And I mean, and you don't really say one way or the other. I mean, obviously the, some of the people have their own theories about what they saw, but what's interesting about the guy, uh, Sean, Kevin, Jason, besides the fact that the guy has three first names is, uh, he's driving to area 51. I, I think, was he looking for something? He was like, look, I felt like he was looking for something to see, all right, why else are you driving to Area 51? And he saw something, but he thinks it was man-made. And he actually pinched himself to make sure that it was real. And he pinched himself so hard that he, he drew blood. So it's like he yeah. wasn't dreaming. Because that's like a lot of things people say. The first thing they'll say is like, oh, you probably fell asleep and you were dreaming. He's like, he actually pinched himself and there was blood coming out. So he wasn't taking a dream. It was not a dream, man. And I actually got to meet Sean maybe a year or so ago. I went on an investigation out to area 51 for uh, a a TV project I was working with. And um, I finally got to meet Sean in person. Uh, I was only able to interview him via email originally for the book. So that that's full circle, dude. When I get to actually like meet some of these people that I've been communicating with for years, and maybe we only talked on the phone or through Skype. um, I got to go to the actual site with Sean where this happened. And it is the most like right. Was that in the barren land? Is that the one on the TV show that I saw you do? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yep. That was cool. So it's literally out to the road that leads to Area 51 is where he saw this. And again, like he was just a guy working at like a pizza shop, I think it was at the time. And for some reason, he felt this pull to go out to that road. He's like, for some reason, I don't can't tell you why. Hmm. I'm not like looking, I'm not a UFO watcher. I'm not something just told me I gotta go out there. And he did. He drove out on this road um leading out to Groom Lake. And uh he saw again one of these triangular craft, and um he couldn't believe what he was seeing. It was Chuck, it was one of the closest encounters I've ever come across. Like he could have literally opened his window and like threw something up and hit this. That's how low it was. Hmm. And uh, like you said, most a lot of people think we're dealing with alien technology with these things. But Sean is up front with like, it was the most incredible thing I've ever seen. I didn't know we as humans have that technology, but I firmly believe it was human. Man-made. Why does he think it was man-made if it's so amazing? I mean, how could we make that? I think for him, you know, being out in Nevada, they probably see a lot of exotic stuff um, because of Area 51. I mean, we we got to think, you know, the U-2 spy plane, um, the stealth bomber, these were all developed 20 years before the public even knew about them out there in Groom Lake. So a lot of people were seeing weird shit out there, not knowing what it was and thinking, whoa, UFO, aliens. When in reality, you know, it was technology that they would eventually bring out to the public. But for our own good, we weren't supposed to know about it. So, so I think Sean has kind of a... um I don't like, I wouldn't say the word cynical, but he has a, uh, a very grounded approach to this and he knows what gets tested out there. And he thinks that, um, that what he saw that night was probably something they're testing. It okay. Um, and then, uh, in chapter six, you, uh, you talk, there's talk to this guy, Eric, I don't even know how to say this last name. Rip, 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 Tomke? rip, 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 the, the Uber oh, light man. rocks guy. Yes. And I the, actually, the rock I went through and I, cause I was so curious of this cause you taught, they talked about video. So I went and looked out, there is video of this and I saw it. And even the, just, I guess, I mean, I don't, 
to me, I hadn't even known about these rocks. I thought the rocks were pretty cool. So, and that's yeah. legit. And, uh, and these playing games with the, with the, uh, object and flashing his headlights on and off. And this was like a long, it was like 50 minutes or something. Yeah. So again, like a lot of these things happen in the blink of an eye and it's gone. But, um, yeah, like you said, Eric, he, um, he was actually like, he discovered this, like basically biolumin. What would you say? I guess luminous I rock. Yeah, it's and, really um, cool looking. Yeah, it's so that cool is thing. a discovery from him then. Yeah, because I'd yeah. never seen I mean, those he before. Had it, uh, he had it published in scientific journals, so he kind of became like the go-to guy in this area. Um, in uh, I believe it was Michigan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I believe uh, this is where this happened. Yeah, Lake Superior, off of Lake Superior, and um, he was bringing a tour out because people started flocking to this town to look for these crazy rocks that like certain water that it hit in certain areas of the Atlantic ocean and uh, the way the sun hits them, they could only be found in this small place in Michigan. And he called them Uper lights. Yeah. Um, I don't remember where the name came from, but uh, he took tons of people on tours to find these things and had a crazy UFO experience over the lake with a bunch of people. And I actually interviewed all of the witnesses separately. Um, mm. And got a very similar account from all of them um about what happened what they saw and uh it's very current this happened in 2019 so you know we're not talking 70s 80s we're talking about current cases and like you said um these strange sort of lights that seem to be somehow attracted to water a lot of these things happen over bodies of water huh. and um they they seem to be under some sort of intelligent control. Like Eric even mentioned, I believe in the book that like he would mess with them. He was in his car and he'd like yeah. flash his headlights, flashing the headlights at them, on. and they would respond to it. Like there, there was like a string of lights over the water, and one would literally dart in to the like beach and go above him, and then go back out into formation. Another would dart in. I just lost my headphones. I got so excited. <laughs> yeah, sorry, brother. That's crazy. And, um, it's crazy. It's crazy. And I, yeah, I feel yeah. like I saw that there's actual video of, I mean, it's, it's hard to make out what's happening, but it is bizarre looking. Yep. And like you said, there, there is video of this event. So, I mean, we have something, we have some sort of data and evidence to prove that something happened out there. But um, I'll tell you this, like he knows those waters. He knows all the ships that go through there like every day, um, bringing stuff into the harbors and everything. So he did his homework uh, between he and I, we reached out to all the ships that were on the water that night and uh, talked to the companies and said, Hey, do you know anything about these weird UFOs? Uh, they were literally over your boats that night. Yeah. Um, and they have to know said something. nothing, right? They said, no comment. We don't wish to comment on the lights. So it wasn't like we didn't see them. Right. It's, we have no comment on the lights. It's a little strange. So they knew something was going on. That's a strange so. response for sure. <sighs> it's weird, man. Yeah. yeah. So then getting into the chapter seven, where you talk about the science versus some of this stuff, I didn't realize the, uh, the term flying saucer was coined over a, a sighting from Mount Rainier. That's my home state of Washington. Yeah, man. You are literally your home state ushered in the entire, basically modern UFO era. I didn't it, know it's, that. It's, it's insane. Yeah. Kenneth Arnold, he was a pilot, a commercial pilot, and he saw nine crescent shaped discs, basically craft um, over Mount Rainier. And he said they made unbelievable uh, maneuvers and he got to the ground. He reported this. And um, what happened is this is pretty funny. Uh, when he reported it to a local newspaper, they said, could you describe kind of how they moved and everything? And he was like, well, it was kind of like if a saucer like was skipping off water. That's kind of how they moved. Oh. And um, even though the object itself wasn't saucer shaped, this newspaper misquoted him and said what he witnessed oh. was a flying saucer. Okay, and then, interesting. Boom, flying saucer craze hits. And now everyone starts seeing saucers. So you truly have to wonder, were they influenced by this one misquote in the newspaper? Or what is going on there? So yeah, man, Seattle or excuse me, Washington itself, my home literally state. 
um, gave me the life I have today. (laughs) Well, yeah. And this is another one that's, uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting things in my state now in Arizona, uh, but Sedona, this, this guy who was, again, so many educated people, this doctor, Dr. Robert uh, Davis, he's an audiologist. He's, he saw these orange orbs in Sedona. There's a lot of mysterious, weird shit that happens in Sedona anyways. Yeah. So I've been out there once. Um, I, I spent a lot of time in Phoenix. I do, uh, I speak at conferences out there. They have like mm-hmm. the biggest one every year, the international UFO Congress. I saw that. Call. I kind of want to go to that. It sounds fun. Uh, it's fun, man. Um, I, so I, when I first got involved in the whole UFO thing, I would volunteer there. Like I'd work backstage and I'd be the one putting oh, the mics on all the speakers okay. and um, recording everything. And uh, I loved it. I got to get out of New York City. I got to go to um, Arizona and I got to hear all these people talk about UFOs for like 10 days straight. And for someone like me, that's amazing. It'd be like, you know, going to like a 10 day um, whatever concert um, festival. And um, I loved it. And one time I was there working, we went out for a trip to Sedona because I'd heard all these crazy stories. And I will say when I went out there with people, uh, we saw stuff. Like we saw some crazy lights. We saw um, what we believe to have been uh, not satellites, but something so far up in the atmosphere that um, it was making these incredible movements. So it wasn't like shooting stars or anything like that. Could have been satellites, but dude, these things were making like 90 degree turns and like just jetting all over the place. And I don't know what it is about Sedona. A lot of people think, there's some sort of weird vortex electromagnetic vortex stuff going out there kind of like bermuda triangle or something okay it's just a place it's a haven for ufo activity yeah um, for sure i'll have to yeah it's crazy i'll have to look for for up more in the sky next time i'm there but you mentioned satellite so tell me about um what this guy dave cody cody is that how i say his name he saw some erratic lights in vancouver and he actually started this is it CubeSat, a satellite thing? And it, it took him, he said he had two kids in the time that it took him to get a, approval from Congress to launch the satellite, but it was supposed to launch in January, 2021. So did it launch? Is that thing up there? I don't believe so. Shit. I think he hit another roadblock. Damn but it. I, I do have exciting news. Okay. Um, so CubeSat itself that uh, Dave worked with isn't up there, but there are several other people in the book that I, um, I've interviewed who are also doing very similar things um, because this is the big thing now. Like you can pay companies to literally do like an Elon Musk thing where they put your mini satellite into the big payload that then Musk shuttles will bring out to the, um, the outer atmosphere. And the so, point is to, to, to clarify for people that the yeah. reason to do this is to gather information, right? To try to get some sort of data of some sort, right? Of movement or lights or, or video or... Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, there's every reason under the sun for a lot of these people to put, uh, quote unquote, CubeSats up there. But for Dave specifically, it was to try to record data and evidence of anomalous activity coming into our planet and into our atmosphere. And um, and what could be going on out there? And we have the technology now, man, where like that data can get shot down to a computer, put in the cloud within like minutes, if not, you know, seconds, which is insane that this Mm -hmm. is where we're at with technology now, which is really exciting for people like Dave, who I hope eventually he'll get that thing up there. But I do know several others who already have theirs up there and are already feeding data back uh, to their independent organizations. Oh, that's exciting. And then um, another one in this chapter that stood out to me was uh, Christopher O'Brien, because again, Washington, he's from Bellevue, which is like right next to where I grew up in Issaquah. He said non-human entities followed him home. And then he, he ended up, uh, this John Keel guy, was uh, he, he was actually investigating several other incidents in Bellevue. That's kind of yeah. scary. This is like right where I grew up. What was going on in so Bellevue? So much happened, man, where you're from. It's crazy. Um, yeah, Chris O'Brien is a, a old friend of mine, a colleague uh, who's been into this whole UFO thing for God decades at this point. And he had a weird experience as a, a younger adult um, with these weird entities that he described were very, um, I guess, alien-like, kind of this 
prototypical big head, black eye sort of beings that uh, followed him home one night, which is crazy. And in the meantime, uh, uh, John Keel was also investigating stuff going on in Bellevue. And hmm. um, John Keel, for any of your viewers and listeners who don't know, is famous for the Mothman. Uh, he is literally oh, okay. the first person to go to West Virginia and investigate the entire Mothman phenomenon. Um, That's an interesting case for sure. It is. And he wrote, you know, the famous book, Mothman Prophecy, that was turned into a movie. And uh, but he got his start looking into the stuff going on in Washington. And mm. um, even with what Christopher O'Brien in my book was a part of. So uh, it's a cr crazy, weird small circle of people in all these uh like research fields of the supernatural paranormal oh UFOs yeah we're like the breakfast club man it's crazy it's crazy so yeah just when you know you think your your book is is interesting i mean then it just like you take it up a notch and then you start talking about actually seeing these these beans so you're kind of hint at it that one but then this one where they go to uh, the farm in uh in uh, tennessee and this guy had seen some uh, some objects so you, you they bring out a field investigator who Whose, whose job it is to investigate these things. And they saw a craft and then they, they ran down a cornfield and they saw a small gray bean. According, this is just the, their testimony. We don't have like visual hard evidence of this, but this is the story. This is pretty, I mean, it's pretty crazy stuff. I mean, if they made this up, it's pretty creative because. Yeah, man. And, and the thing with this field, and I try to tell people all the time, like I am a collector of stories. I'm not like, drag that hardcore just the facts man mm -hmm. like that's not me but for these investigators that you're mentioning that is their job they right. were a rapid response team that would go out to active ufo phenomena happening if they could and try to capture it so kind of like ghostbusters again, for aliens exactly exactly they were called the uh the star team and okay. um dude they booked it out to tennessee they got into this dude's cornfield where they were seeing flying saucers, orbs, flying triangles. And like you said, they're in the field and they come across an actual entity of some sort for a couple seconds. And then they jet out of there because they're so scared and they, they hightail it out. And then that's it. And of course, like people like me are like, are you kidding me? You could have like taken a photo of this. You could have done that. You could have done this. But the woman I interviewed, part of the start team, she said, dude, I worked with the Department of Defense. I worked with Homeland Security. I've been doing this UFO investigation thing for half my life. I know how to do my job. And I can tell you right now, the last thing I was thinking of in that moment was snap a picture. Like when you have your perception altered in that moment of seeing something your brain has never seen before and could possibly be non-human, um, you can't judge someone for how they react to that. And for her, and the the witness and the other investigator, they felt this intense fear, like they had to get out of there immediately. So no, I try not to blame her too much. Yeah, no, that, that's but. funny you mentioned that because I was just in Flagstaff a couple weeks ago and we saw a bear, and it, I was like, I turn around, there's a bear just sitting on these rocks, and it was the same thing. Like later, I was like, man, I should have taken a picture, but and my instinct was like bear and i just start running which i think is the worst thing you can do in those situations but right. i mean i was it was like an instinct i was like freaked out i was like this bear's gonna kill me i later found out the bears in arizona are pretty harmless for the most part so they're pretty chill i probably could have taken a picture i'm so happy you brought that up though man because that's the biggest argument in the skeptical community people like neil degrasse tyson bring this up all the time like okay all these ufo events are happening people claim to have been abducted why are they not recording this? Everyone has a phone now. Like you literally have an evidence capture on you at all times. Why isn't this happening? And I can't pretend to have like a solid answer for that. But all I can say is when you're seeing something you've never seen before, like your brain goes to mush. You're not thinking of, I need to Snapchat this or YouTube live stream this for the world to see. Like that's your experience right there hmm. it's the most personal thing and most profound thing you can be experiencing in that moment so of course everyone's not you know take it but and even if they do when's the last time you've seen like a good ufo photo because i do this every day and everything's blurry or everything's cgi so like it can't be taken as evidence any longer well it's that's yeah can't. that's the other thing is like you could post a, a, a good photo or a good video, but it could, how do you know it's not fake? Cause the, with technology, I mean, there's apps that you can 
change what you completely look like. I mean, I've seen like people, you know, turn into Obama and start talking and you're like, wait, that's not even, that's not the president. What, what's going on? I mean, it's, it's weird scary. stuff. So it's like, then yeah. it makes you wonder, I mean, everything could be fake. And that's where I go back to the people um, and their stories. Cause if we don't have the evidence, if we don't have the video, if we don't have data, all we have to rely on at that point is the person. Mm -hmm. And then it's up to you to decide if you're going to believe them or not. But I don't even look at it as belief, man. I look at it as this could have happened. Let's at least get it down somewhere and preserve the story. So when we do finally get to that level of like acknowledgement that the evidence is there, the data is there, then we can be like, okay, here's a thousand people who say they saw it. Well, deal with that. But there is some evidence that I want to get into. So like with this guy, Brett, that uh, he, he supposedly saw this uh, gray bean and says that they abduct, abducted him and, and did experiments on him. But then you say in the book that the doctors can't explain the scars that he had. And he did polygraphs and they did a brain scan that measures the part of the brain where you would be making a story up. And it, it, it was actually, it was not a, like it was not running hot or whatever. I, however they did, I don't know how you describe that, but the brain, it was, it was a brain, part of the brain associated with memory, not mm -hmm. the creative part that was being active when he was telling this story. So that's like a step above a polygraph, I think. Absolutely. Cause again, you know, polygraph is so like a lot of people don't even buy into it anymore because it can be, um, you know, manipulated so much and leading and, and everything in between. But for Brett, like, again, he wanted to show people I'm not crazy and I'm also not making this up. So do it, do whatever you want to do. I'm not changing my story. And like you said, he went to great lengths to kind of show people, I'm telling you what I remember. I'm telling you what happened, take it or leave it. So I, I truly respect someone like him who has claimed probably the most extraordinary thing you can, and that's being kidnapped by aliens. I myself am extremely skeptical of the entire alien abduction phenomenon. But I, I again, man, every person in my book if I didn't meet them uh, through Skype or email, I met them in person. And when you look these people in the eye and they tell you this story and they're like shaking and crying, something happened. I'm, I'm not saying it was an alien that kidnapped them and experimented on them. It could be. I wasn't there when it happened, but it affected them mm -hmm. and it's real to them. And we have to look at that. I, I think we truly have to at least look into it and question it. Yeah. And so, and some of the people that in your book, uh, like this Michael Carter guy uh, who was in Mexico or he went to Mexico and he came back to New York and he saw an alien while he was sleeping and uh, he had some experience. And then he later became a minister and he tried, he tried to tie in aliens and religion to creation. That's an interesting connection. So what are your thoughts on that? Because that's another theory behind some of this stuff. Some people say man-made, some people are saying aliens, and then some people are saying religion. Michael is the prime example of what I set out to do with the book. It's someone whose life and trajectory completely changed because of their experience. Uh, he was not a religious person before this. Uh, he claimed to have been taken aboard a craft. He saw these aliens and they kept giving him these weird symbols in, um, in, in these states that he was in huh. when these occurred. And one of those symbols was um, hands in kind of a prayer, like, uh, you know, motion with a lightning bolt going through it. And he was like, huh, how do I interpret that? And he took that as um, like prayer healing. And he was like, ah, I'm gonna look more into this. I'm gonna look more into religion and stuff and maybe take a look at the Bible and everything. And he did. And eventually, like you said, he became a minister of a church having not had any religious upbringing or interest in God prior to that. So talk about like a complete 180, but um, the whole, the whole religious aspect of this really fascinates me. Um, you know, some people think it's aliens that are doing this. Some people think they're demons. Some people think they're angels. Um, it really depends, Chuck, on the, uh, the, the lens in which you look at the experience. Mm -hmm. People will interpret these things completely differently. Um, even dating back to like the sightings of Fatima, of these children who claimed that they saw the Virgin Mary and whatnot. Um, the way they described it at the time seemed miraculous. And it was, it was um, you know, very godlike. But the more you look into it and the more the people at that time, the way they described what they experienced, 
it sounds more and more like a UFO encounter. It was a cylindrical Dude, object illuminating. Wild. And you're just like, oh my God, it really does depend on everything. Yeah. The, the cultural lens you put through it, the religious lens, the psychological lens, um, or the hard data science lens. And that's what I love about being into this UFO thing, man. Like it's endless possibilities to the most amorphous phenomena I truly believe is out. Oh, for sure. So, and then, you know, you talk about, uh, there's a couple of people in chapter 15 where you talk about these people that do, um, you know, like therapy with people who claim to have been abducted by uh, aliens or UFOs or whatever. And um, this one guy, Michael Melton, he, he coined the term post-abduction stress disorder. And he says that 90% of these people have a strong similarity to each and every one of the stories, like worldwide, not just like us, like worldwide, like 90% of these people, the stories are the same. The 10% difference, he says that may be associated with people who have mental illness or they're fake or they're wannabes, but the 90%, I mean, that's a, that's a really high number. That's really, that's, I found that really interesting. It's astounding. And to me, you know, people like Michael and, uh, and the, the famous uh, Harvard psychiatrist, Dr. John Math. Uh, this guy was like Pulitzer Prize winning, um, just one of the smartest psychiatrists out there. And um, he got involved with this alien abduction topic because he believed that this was a mental disorder, that this was completely a, a new version of like hysteria and mental illness. So he dug into it and he came out on the other side being like, a, these people are not crazy. They are not fantasy prone. Um, a lot of explanations for alien abductions are people who have regressed uh, memories of childhood trauma or um, sexual abuse. And you know, this is their way of kind of coping and dealing with it. Let me put this weird alien abduction lens on it so I don't have to deal with the reality of the, the actual thing that happened. Huh. So he came out on the other side being like, this is not what these people are i mean it's just not it's simply not so for people like john mack the biggest like reputation at the time as a psychiatrist risking his career to get into this alien abduction thing and come out saying these people believe this happened and i can't argue or deny that um it truly makes me feel that something's going on and yeah. again people all over the world saying the same stories and we're talking like pre-internet, pre-chat um, forums, mm -hmm. and people from Africa, people in China, people in America, all claiming that these things are happening to them by similar beings or um, you know similar experiments being done on them. You truly have to wonder, like, how does that happen if not it's actually happening? I, I guess that's the way I can the only way I can say. It. Yeah. There's just, there's so many things. Um, you, and then, uh, one, another person you mentioned in the book, Dr. Chris Cogswell, again, this guy's a chemical engineer with a PhD. Um, and, uh, real briefly, you guys, you bring up, I think when you're talking about him, Skinwalker Ranch, you, you don't meant, you don't really go into that in detail in the book, but what are your thoughts on that? Cause I watched an entire show on the history channel. It was like a docu-series kind of thing where they go there and some weird stuff happens. But what are you, what are your thoughts on that place? Do you think that is that have some sort of connection to this? So I actually interviewed the owner of Skinwalker Ranch um, maybe a couple months ago okay. on uh, the podcast I do I'll have to because listen to that I one. was yeah it's a good one man. okay it was a lot of fun he he shared some stuff that uh, I don't think he necessarily meant to but that's what oh. happens when you get in these long form conversations and uh, I try to wear him down to get the the really good stuff you know that he's not saying on a million other interviews or yeah. whatnot but um I will tell you like I've been out to skinwalker ranch not on the property itself but on the outer um premises and it's not just that ranch um it is all of the areas in that um uh unita basin that are that is just full of paranormal activity ufos um dating all the way back to like you know pre-white settlers being there um this all supposedly started with a curse between different uh, tribes of Native Americans who had settled there and one tribe put a curse on the other and that became what they called the Skinwalker. That is the legend of the Skinwalker, a shape-shifting creature that was sent out to kill and murder the animals so that 
the other tribe couldn't eat or even take their young and, and all this crazy stuff. And then you get the white settlers coming in and taking over the land and the curse just multiplies. So it's crazy, dude. And I have talked to the owner. I have talked to the, um, the groundskeeper and um, there's something to it. They're, they, I know what show you're talking about. We yeah. Can talk about the, the television show uh, in the interview. And there's and, stuff in that uh, show that they don't even explain. Like the something attacked the the uh, the animals, the uh, llamas. I think they had they, something yeah. bit them, and they they don't even say they don't know what it was, and they just try to fix up the animals. And this is some Cattle weird mutilations yeah. and uh, weird electromagnetic activity happening. Their yeah, all their equipment just, fails and stuff. Uh, dude, it's something. And again, this this goes back to this whole idea that there are these areas that I think. Uh, that um, Sedona is, that I think places like Stonehenge, Bermuda Triangle, there's something going on on this planet in these areas that is inviting the craziest of things we could never imagine. And uh, you truly have to wonder why, why is it there? And uh, what is it? <laughs> you know, That's all I want to know. Yeah. What is it? Yeah. yeah. So uh, your last chapter of your book, and then we'll go on to some other stuff that's not in the book, if that's okay. But Kevin Day, I mean, this was a big one. Kevin Day, uh, 2004, he was a U.S. Navy pilot. This is the Tic Tac video. This is, I think, pretty famous. If people don't know anything about the subject, they should definitely Google this. But he later had, I didn't know this part about it. So this, because the video didn't come out until like, I think it was like 10 or 15 years later, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he later had dreams of ap apocalyptic doom and dread. That's kind of yeah. scary. Yeah. So, yeah, again, um, the Tic Tac event uh, is probably the most now current famous UFO event of all time. It was one of three videos that came out officially from the Department of Defense and mm -hmm. the Navy. Um, it was in the New York Times story that came out in 2017. And, you know, briefly, um, a bunch of people on the Nimitz carrier in 2004, uh, they, Kevin, was the chief radar operator and he tracked all these weird things on radar during a training exercise, mind you, with fighter jets in the air. He said, I don't know what's going on, but there's like a swarm of stuff coming at us. Like we should probably go investigate that. That's when they sent up the pilots and that's how we got the testimony of uh, Commander David Framer, a Top Gun pilot who was outmaneuvered by this Tic Tac shaped object that went from 80,000 feet in the air down to the surface of the ocean and back up to like 40,000 feet within a second. Like hmm. that, that, nothing we have can do that. If our fighter pilots are saying it did this, I believe them. And I also believe that they know we are not capable of that. No human could survive a right. speed like that. And one of the and, theories um, I think yeah. was on uh, was on the TV show or an interview I, re I heard you say that they were talking about how one of the theories for this thing is that it's some sort of hologram, but that might explain a couple of the, the incident, the later incidents, but not the 2004, because that technology was not around in 2004. So that Apparently, one cannot be explained yeah. with the hologram. <laughs> if that is not saying that any of them could be the hologram, but that was just a, a potential theory that, that it's maybe they're projecting some sort of hologram on because you can clearly see the object in the video. Yeah. yeah. Right, man. It's there. It's, it's it was a physical object a lot of the argument is you know this is glitches in the cameras or it's a, a lens flare that the pilots saw but no multiple sensors pick these things up from gun cameras to radar to um uh we're now even learning sonar caught these things there were mm. tracks caught on their sonar radars with this tick down um that's a whole story for another and did time. They, but, did it shut yeah. down their weapons too? Or was that, was that every time or some of the times their weapons are shut down or malfunction or something? So the gentleman who took that video, the Tic Tac video, Chad Underwood, another Top Gun pilot, he has come forward and said that their radar on their plane was jammed, which also would jam their weapon system. Now, you have to remember this was a training exercise. So they did not have live weapons, but they had what they call mm dummy missiles okay um and at that time the radar was jammed and that dummy missile system went down so if this was a real world event and they you know had to shoot on it that they couldn't it was jammed and we have heard this throughout the decades of ufos doing this to fighter pilots um 
a famous case being in Iran back in 1976, where a pilot tried to shoot on something and his weapons completely jammed and he couldn't. Um, but yeah, it's crazy, man. And to get back to Kevin, I'm sorry. I oh, went sorry, on yeah. Tangent, tangent there. Um, a prime example of, you know, these are pilots, these are military people, and we like to think they are trained observers and they're very credible, which they are. They know what's in the sky and what shouldn't be, mm -hmm. um, but they're also human. And these events affect them just like it would someone, you know, in Ohio seeing a UFO over a drive-in theater. Um, it ultimately affects you. So for Kevin, dude, like in him and the pilots, they didn't talk about this for, like you said, decades because of the stigma and ridicule right. of talking about these things. And also a lot of them were told they could not talk about it. So Kevin mm. kind of carried that with him for decades. And the people he did tell made fun of him or said he was crazy or that's why he's not in the military anymore because he talked about this dumb UFO thing and they thought he was crazy. And then boom, when that video first ran on CNN or whatever back in 2017 and he saw the Tic Tac on his TV screen, yeah, he started crying, man. Because yeah. he was like, holy shit. Like, finally. Justified. That's, I'm ju like, I'm not crazy. And for him, the world changed in that instant when that Tic Tac was seen on television. And um, like you said, after the event, he started having all these weird dreams of like apocalyptic messages. And we hear that a lot with people who have had UFO experiences um, or claimed abductions. They're shown images of like the world being destroyed. Or uh, you go back to the 60s and 70s where you had the contactee movement, as they called it. All these people claiming that they were on a ship with a, you know, uh, an alien from Venus and shot them across the galaxy, brought them back and said, you need to, you know, Earth has to get its act together. Stop with the nuclear weapons. Stop with the pollution. Stop fighting. Stop hating one another for the color of your skin. Like, if you really want to be a part of the Galactic Federation, you got to get your act together. Um, yeah, wasn't there stuff with the nuclear that, power yeah. plants where they would... They would see like a lights or something, and then the nuclear power plants would malfunction or something. Something about that, I thought. Hundreds of cases, and this is extremely alarming. We have people who have gone on record at the National Press Club in Washington, and um, have gone to other countries as well, who worked at nuclear missile installations or nuclear power plants, and these UFOs seem to be very interested in our nuclear activity. I mean, you look at the first atomic bomb detonation, and soon after is when the whole flying saucer craze truly started. So you have to wonder, mm. was that kind of a beacon to the rest of the the universe or the galaxy of, what's that little blue thing doing over there? Like, that could affect us. We should probably keep an eye on them. And dude, like, I have talked to so many people who worked at nuclear installations who have told me on the record that their ordinance, whether it was a missile or a system or a nuclear reactor, were shut down because of these UFOs. So that is they, so fascinating. Yeah, I think I read that in the book and I was just like, what? It's mind blowing. So why? Why are they interested in it? If they have the capability to shut these things down, what's to say they can't turn them on? Yeah. Or, so yeah. that's where the whole potential threat aspect comes to all this as well, which is what the Pentagon is kind of talking about right you know, so these things could be a threat so yeah so let's talk i mean i know this has been covered to death joe rogan you did an episode about a, a movie that is made about bob lazar but just real quick i'm sure most people know who he is if not he was an area 51 employee he says that there is another civilization that we have artifacts from them he says we capture an alien craft it's being reverse engineered and he worked at area 51 but the skeptics say that you know because he says he graduated from caltech and mit but skeptics say there's no record of that, but he did work. There is a record that he worked at Los Alamos as a physicist. So he must have some sort of degree. Like, do you think that he's been, that maybe they, the government pulled his record or what's, what's your theory on him? I mean, you've never actually interviewed him, but you've, I'm sure you've done your research about him. Yeah. I mean, Bob Lazar is like, he's like the mythical creature of the UFO field. You've got <laughs> like with cryptozoology, you got Loch Ness monster or Bigfoot. Um, for us, it's Bob Lazar, this guy who came out in the 80s and said he reverse engineered flying saucers. These were crashed saucers that have, you know, been retrieved and 
and we're trying to understand how they work. So they did he say? I forget. In. Did he say they they were from the Roswell one or the? Did... I don't know if he necessarily ever said that was specifically okay. the craft he worked on, but that is the rumor that whatever crash in Roswell went from Wright Patterson, Ohio, um, Air Force Base, then to Area Fifty One to then be dismantled and and worked on to try to understand what it was and. And Bob Lazar said that he was one of the physicists who did that. There is a lot of question about the, his credentials and where he went to school. Um, and it's a big, murky, muddy story. And, you know, that's what happens when you come out to the public with such bold claims. There will be people who will vet every single thing you say, and there are people who have done that. So a lot of people believe him, a lot don't. So it's possible that he did go to those schools and that somebody wiped out his records, or it's possible that he's totally full of shit, at least on that part that he didn't go to those schools. Yes. Either is possible. What? He could have been Either the janitor at area 51. Who knows? <laughs> a lot of people think that man, he was making the, uh, the mashed potatoes there, but Hey, he still worked at area 51. That's pretty cool. in my opinion. Yeah. And then, so, but, but anyways, so, so Roswell, that's another, that's a big one. Again, these are ones you don't talk about in your book. Cause they've kind of been talked about to death, but, um, you do the, uh, I think that was on the mysteries decoded one. You guys do Roswell, right? Wasn't that you? Yeah. And yeah, the part yeah. that I didn't know, so, cause I, I remember, you know, obviously the original story, this UFO crash, these people found, you know, this material that was very bizarre material. And then the, you know, I know the whole government's, uh, you know, story is they say it was a weather balloon and, uh, the, the, the bodies were, uh, uh, dummies that they were, they were crash test dummies. But, uh, the part that was interesting was that, um, you interview, they interviewed this girl who was the daughter of the person who found the stuff. And she's like, that was a fake photo that my dad posed with the weather balloon material. She's like, that's not what he found. And he, and he felt really bad, like kind of like lying to the public about it because they told him to, and he's following orders. Right. I, this is like a whole so, other angle. Absolutely, man. So Jesse Marcel was the first military officer on site during the Roswell crash. And, um, his story is probably, you know, the most now famous testimony ever in UFO history that when he got there, it was a craft of unknown origin that crashed. There were pieces everywhere. Um, he eventually got everyone at the Roswell Army Airfield to come out and retrieve this and pick it up because that's what he was told to do. And like you said, everything, all the material from whatever this thing was that crashed, um, I still don't think we truly know what it is. I don't think anyone truly knows uh, except those who have unfortunately passed on at this point. Our firsthand testimony of this event is done with. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's a single living firsthand witness to the, the crash at this point. But um, Jesse Marcel was basically the first to come forward and say, it wasn't ours. It was not a rival nation. It was not a weather balloon. And that photo, that famous photo of him holding up foil with like, you know, balsa wood, yeah. that, that, that was staged. He, they had some of the material from the actual craft in a room ready to go. And he was like, we want you to pose with this. He's like, okay, they're like, but we got to, we got to go through some stuff with you first. So they go into another room and they're like, so show us on the map exactly where the wreckage was. And this is with all his superiors and whatnot. He's like, it was here. They're like, okay, good, good. By the time he got back into the room where the press was now there and his superiors were there, it was replaced by the most simple tin foil stuff from a weather balloon, tape, wood. And he was just like, what the, what, what, what is this? And if you look at that photo, man, the look on his face. He looks confused. He's like, what, it, what is going on? Yeah. And why are they covering it up? So um, it's a crazy story. And I got to meet his, his great granddaughter mm -hmm. and, um, and speak to her. And uh, she firmly believes everything her great grandfather and her father said as well, because her father touched this stuff. So he literally pocketed some of the alien craft or whatever originally crashed there and brought it home for his family to see. But then they and took they, it from him, right? Apparently he, he put it back in a box. And again, he was a Patriot. Like he did what he was told. Yeah. Um, I think that would eventually come around to bite him in the ass. Cause they didn't care about making him look like a fool. Be like, look at this major who mistook a weather balloon for, for a alien craft. Like, ah, what an idiot. We'll be more careful next time and put someone more, you know, experienced out there and kind of like threw him to the wolves, man. But to his dying day, he said, that is not what was out there. And whatever it was, we covered it up and we did it 
pretty damn well because nobody talked about Roswell for almost 30 years or 40 years until, uh, you know, the story started really getting out there. So yeah. whatever it was, whatever happened, it was definitely covered up that much. For sure. Yeah. So here's another one. This is supposedly one of the most uh, credible alien abductions in history. The Salter file, uh, Salter and his son, they uh, they claim to have gone inside a spacecraft. They were and they were gently probed by aliens. Stuff that he felt was like kind of like medical procedures. And then in the years following, his health improved, and his scar. He had this big scar on his head, and it disappeared. And people were like, "What happened to your scar?" And he's like, "And so that's when he finally came forward. He's like, told this like alien story that sounds like outrageous, but I mean." That is like, I mean, I guess I'm trying to think what year this was, because I feel like that was before they had the technology medically to do that. Or I don't know. Yeah. What's your thought on that one? You'll have to forgive me. That one was a while ago. I remember covering that on a TV show. Yeah, I um, think that's where I saw it. Yeah. Yeah. I want to say that was like 70s, maybe. So you're right. Yeah. That seems this, like it would be they, before they, they could do that with. The, yeah. We didn't have like laser technology to get rid of your scar. Yeah. At, at least to our knowledge, we didn't have it. But I don't think even if we did that, some random guy, you know, who was very blue collar would be like, I want the most expensive, sophisticated scar removal. Give it to me. Um, <laughs> so you have to wonder, man, yeah. like if this story is true and if it is like, do these intelligences have the the ability to cure us from certain things? You know, I always go back to like that famous Twilight Zone episode, The GIF where like this town, a, a UFO crashes and this alien assumes a human form. And, uh, you know, they're, it's kind of like Frankenstein. They're like, we found out who the alien is, kill him, kill him. And they end up killing this dude. And then they find out that he was brought to earth to cure every illness Ugh. that humanity would ever, ever endure. And um, boom, again, like humans not wanting to deal with an other and being right. like, nope gotta go well that was yeah that was kind of an interesting point that someone one of the witnesses in your book brought up was that i don't know that humans are ready to accept uh, a different species like we can't even get along with other humans like we talk about you know these differences with race and things and people from other countries like how the hell would they accept someone from a different planet like that would that would be tough so it's tough man and you gotta wonder that's probably why these aliens haven't made themselves seen to all of us yet yeah they see what we're capable of and like just how far behind we are i think in many respects but um look this topic of ufos if it's real and if it's alien then it could be the biggest unifier this planet could ever endure yeah maybe so, that's what know. it is we'll, we'll all be either yeah. with or against the aliens but who knows yeah with uh so there's a couple of stories too of astronauts that have had uh, some sort of encounters i heard you talking about this one on another podcast uh this this japanese american astronaut i never heard this story before he was he was sent up to go on the Challenger one and they, they, they put him through all these rigorous tests and, you know, to make sure they're ready to go into space. And they watched a UFO film at NASA. This is what he claims that the video was very graphic and there was an alien autopsy in the video. And it, so was that real footage or was it fake just to test the astronauts? Your guess is as good as mine, man. Um, that was um, a pretty crazy thing, story yeah. though. huh? It's crazy. The first Japanese American and Hawaiian, actually to go into space um so this guy had some serious cred and uh in a uh, reputation to uphold and he did make the claim that when he was working at nasa um and even prior to nasa it might have been as well uh that him and several others were brought into rooms and shown these videos of ufos and then an alien autopsy which is crazy and and they were shown these things dude with no context um they weren't told after like, that's real, or don't talk about that. They just did it. And then they said, you're excused. And for me, that's like some weird psychological. Yeah. Thing. So either it was all fake and they were messing with these guys, or maybe they wanted to see how they would react. Cause these are again, astronauts going out into space. And if they're like, you know, what if they do see something out there? Didn't that is somebody so mind blowing? Yeah, didn't somebody uh, Edgar Mitchell was another astronaut. He he saw something. Yeah, he said we are definitely Edgar not Mitchell, alone. Gordon Cooper. Um, a lot of astronauts have come forward and claimed they've seen highly anomalous things out there. And uh, and look, when you're in space looking back at the planet, I'm sure that's like the most profound experience you can ever have. 
But that wasn't it for these guys. I think some of them, um, even some that have been to the moon, uh, had experiences that probably altered their entire perception, their entire reality, made them truly wonder what is out there and, uh, and, and, and what could be. So yeah, if you go back and look at the history of astronauts and UFOs, it's astounding how many have come forward and been like, I have no doubt. Have Didn't no they doubt say they saw like something on the moon or something too? There have been claims that uh, we were not the first to get there. And that's all I've really been told. But you have to wonder that last time we went there, why have we not been well, why back? Why haven't we been back? Maybe there was something there that told us, yo, we got this. Moon is ours. I don't know. But there has to be a reason. There, there, there's besides obviously just lack of funding. You've you know? all, and you've obviously heard about the the fake moon landing. What are your thoughts on that? There's a lot. There's some people that really believe that that Kubrick <laughs> directed it. It was all a movie, right? So you know, I, I run across every conspiracy theory. Being a UFO guy, yeah. So I I'm used to hearing them all, and you really have to be like extremely objective when it comes to all of that because you can go down a rabbit hole. Uh, I do believe we went to the moon. And I have faith and uh, I truly respect the people who have risked their lives to go to the moon. Um, you know, that famous video of, was it Buzz Aldrin? It punched the guy the in the dude? face. <laughs> oh my God, I love that. Because that's like every astronaut's power going into that one fist and mm -hmm. being like, fuck you. Like I risked my entire life yeah. to do this for the furtherance of like space exploration. Right, um, yeah. So look, maybe... Maybe the video is fake. Maybe they were like, uh, eh, our cameras aren't good enough or like, we don't know what's really going to happen. So let's, uh, let's just, they're there and it happened, but maybe that video was directed by Kubrick. I don't know. Hmm, that's an interesting like, theory. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? But, uh, yeah. uh, okay. Travis Walton, we got to talk about this one too, because this was my home state and this is another one of the most famous alien abductions. Uh, he was beamed into a ship. His friends saw it. And both Travis and all his friends, they all passed not only polygraphs, but it was like multiple polygraphs, which is like, if you take multiple polygraphs, like the more times you take it, the less likely it is that, you know, I mean, if you, if you pass it multiple times, like it's very, the, the incense of you actually being able to beat it or like it maybe you know, like you were actually lying, like it's very, very rare that they would be lying. And I mean, that one's just really unusual. Like, right. It's really just weird. Like the, the they could pass those polygraphs. What are your thoughts on yeah. that one? Is that one real? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's probably one of the most well documented and investigated uh, alien abduction experiences out there. You know, the famous Fire in the Sky movie. Yeah. Based on this experience, oh, that movie is terrifying. By the way, <laughs> I, I, I have nightmares every time I watch it. But um, yes. So Snowflake, Arizona, six or seven loggers, I forget, were out there. Um, you know, they they finished their work for the day. And uh, they saw this craft in the sky. And this one guy, Travis, got out and wanted to check it out. And a beam hit him from this craft and um, shot him back. And his friends freaked out and hightailed it. They freaking left him there, man. Some friends, in my yeah, opinion. But right? um, they were scared. Again, like, we're not these people. We're not in this cornfield with an alien. And we're not in this, like, these backwoods of Snowflake, Arizona with a craft shooting a beam at someone. So like, again, I don't, I try not to judge, but look, they, uh, they went back to try to find him and he was missing. So they went for to the five police. days, right? For Five days. Man. And nobody the could police. find him. Yeah. And they thought they murdered him. Like they thought this was like some elaborate story they made up that their friend was abducted by aliens. Cause they legitimately thought these guys like either accidentally or purposefully murdered this guy. So for like five days, you know, police were grilling them, putting them under the polygraphs, like you said. Um, the FBI got involved, like this, that, this, Yeah, that. wasn't there a and lot then, of, like, uh, quote-unquote, men in black that kind of showed up to the town? That's a little suspicious. Supposedly. Yeah, yeah. They claimed that people from different agencies showed up and uh, were really interested in hearing the UFO side to all of it. And um, like you said, dude shows up after five days disheveled. Uh, he, was, he showed up, like, miles away from where the event happened. And um, okay, they didn't murder him, but then, you know, what do you do now? And he came forward and said that after the beam hit him, all he remembers is being on a craft and 
seeing these aliens and that they were trying to experiment on him and he wasn't having it. He literally like got up off the table and punched one of these aliens in the face. Wow. <laughs> yeah, man. So it's a crazy story and it's very controversial, but they all pretty much stick to the story until today. And yeah, the polygraph you know, thing it. really, I, I mean, it. multiple polygraphs that really, it's hard to, they believe what they I mean, you know what I mean? Like they must really believe it. I mean, it's possible it could be our government, you know, doing some sort of brainwashing on them, but I mean, it's whatever some, something's going on there for sure. Something's going on. And I, like I said, I've met Travis several times. Oh, have now. you super like down to earth guy, uh, forgive the pun, but he, um, he is just so like, he never wavers. Like you could challenge him with every little trip up question and he's, he's there and he's ready to answer it. And again, like, either this guy is the greatest liar in history of like alien abductions, or I firmly believe something happened out there that they couldn't explain. And look, you can, the UFO part of it is crazy enough. And like those loggers probably saw that happen, but then you have this one, only one guy who could truly say that that abduction happened. So um, it's, it's hard. It's a hard story to swallow, but at the same time, it's so well documented and uh i just can't help but think that holy shit that 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 probably happened that could have happened and uh yeah there's so many yeah there's so many cases i mean like i said you know people just read this book i mean you know it's <laughs> that's a terrible here there we go this, your book oh, is thanks, like man. there's so many stories not just those ones but yeah those are some that are not in the book i mean so uh, Bottom line, though, do you trust the government? Like, do you think the government is being honest? Because when I asked my dad about my dad's really into a lot of different subjects, but he reads a lot. And he was the one that kind of first one that opened my mind about a lot of this stuff. And he's like, once you start going down the rabbit hole on any subject, he's like, you'll see, like, you'll learn so much about something. So I asked him about this and that's his biggest thing. He's like, I just don't know if I trust the government that they're, they're being honest with us. What are your thoughts on that? How can you? And I, I do agree with your dad because you know, getting off of UFOs completely, our government, our militaries have done some pretty horrendous things, uh, even to their own citizens. Right. So, you know, and a lot of it they say is for the furtherance of science. Like, fine, fine. Um, you know, be it that as it may, when it comes to the UFO topic, I always go back to Roswell. Like, they immediately lied to the public about what happened, no matter what it was. Maybe it was some top secret experimental aircraft. Maybe it was a weather balloon. Maybe it was an alien craft from whatever, Zeta Reticuli. But the fact of the matter is they lied to the American public about it. And maybe they had to for certain reasons. I can't tell you. But like, there you go, man. And there have been so many other examples throughout UFO history where they have lied to the public. And we've then found out, oh, um, you know, the government looked into UFOs, it was called Project Blue Book, but we closed it because, uh, you know, we found an explanation to everything or mostly everything. It's not a security threat, so we're going to move on. We're never looking into UFOs again. And then boom, 2017, New York Times leaks a story that the government has secretly been investigating UFOs within the Pentagon. So well, how yeah. can you trust them? And what okay. else are they? This is another one that I just learned about this thing. I don't know how I've never heard of this. The Montauk Project. It's a secret government program uh, where supposedly maybe they experimented on children. And this kind of inspired the Stranger Things TV. I had no idea that that I thought that was a totally made up, you know, show. This kind of inspired that show. And um, you did an episode on this uh, with with a guy who made the Montauk Chronicles movie, which I haven't seen that yet, but I want to. And that's a fascinating topic. Well, what is your thoughts on that? Explain that to people, like, because they don't really have any conclusive evidence as to what went on there. But there was some it's kind of like an Area 51 in a way, like we don't know what went on there. Right. Yeah. So this used to be a um, like a radar tracking area on Long Island here on the East Coast um, in Montauk which is like the furthest tip of, of Long Island. And um, there was this big radar there that was used for you know uh, military purposes, for Department of Defense, everything you could think of. Um, it was eventually decommissioned um, and it just kind of sat there bearing and rotting away. Um, so you've got all these underground bunkers still there. You've got like the radar tower literally decaying. It's so cool 
to look at. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of like Chernobyl or like a war zone. Like you would go and but see. Isn't, isn't it still fenced off? Like you can't go inside of it. Yeah, it, it's fenced off because it's a it's a it's a safety hazard first and foremost. But the government does still own that land. And uh supposedly back in the 70s and 80s, um it's a crazy convoluted story, but the Cliff Notes version is that there were scientists that kind of took over this this Montauk installation. They kind of went rogue and started their own splinter MK Ultra sort of weird scientific experiments. And yeah, they would kidnap uh, you know, um, kids from orphanages or runaways. You know, they'd head in head into like New York City and like go to like um uh, like the gay district and all these young kids who kind of like had nowhere to go or um, like nowhere to live and everything, just take them off the street and be like, we're going to put you somewhere safe and where you'll be accepted. And then boom, they start doing all these weird mind altering experiments on them and um, just the craziest, darkest shit. Man. And again, like there may be nothing to it, or this might be one of the deepest, darkest secrets in American history. It's pretty crazy. Did you watch you, yeah. that episode? I know you weren't in because you're on a couple of those mysteries decoded, but uh, they did an episode on Montauk and they, they find this boy who was supposedly uh, there and he went under yeah. hypnosis. It was pretty creepy. He is what is claimed as a Montauk boy. Yeah. Montauk he was boy. One of those that did it. I'm yeah. They put him under hypnosis and he looked pretty effective. So again, it kind of even brings me back to the whole alien abduction thing. It's like this person could believe this so much that it does become the reality, or maybe they've convinced themselves of this. So I always try to keep that mm -hmm. skeptical. Sure. Eye. But at the same time, like that dude in that episode was clearly affected and traumatized mm -hmm. by something. Yeah. So there might be some truth to it. I, 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 I don't know. And the, 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 the most outlandish thing that, that, that some people think happened there was the time travel, which is really interesting to me. I don't know how much I believe that that's possible, but it sure was fascinating to, to hear that that's a rumor. I mean, there's clearly something yeah. crazy going on there that I, I'd be curious. And also, I think in that episode, they explained that uh, there is a lower level that wasn't on the, the, uh, the map or so that's kind of crazy. Like the guy, uh, the, he's from the other, uh, tinfoil pod, uh, tinfoil hat podcast or whatever, yeah, Sam Tripoli. Yeah, yeah. He's a, he's, he's an a, interesting guy, dude. He is a riot, man. You gotta get I, him I, on I met, your podcast. I know he will talk for hours on end. I don't know where his energy comes he from. He believes in the time machine thing. Like hundred percent. It sounds like he believes in everything, which I love. <laughs> like I'm, I'm all about that, man. Like, I, I too am extremely open-minded. Clearly I've dedicated my life to like UFOs, but like there comes a point for me where I have to step back and be like, all right, like ground yourself. There's this old cliche of like, keep an open mind, yeah. but not so open to brains. Well, fall. that's what's so great about that episode is because the girl is a total skeptic and she's like, yeah. do you know, I talked to a physicist and to do time travel, you would need the energy that's, that's equivalent to a black hole. Yep. And so, okay, maybe not you did time as travel, but have you seen that movie Mirage Men? Are you familiar with this, this documentary about this guy who reported a UFO and then the military made him think that he saw aliens so that he would be discredited because they were actually experimenting with uh, some experimental aircrafts or something. Have you seen this? Yes. So this is the, the famous, I guess, in UFO history, uh, Paul Benowitz affair. Um, and this gets into a very interesting territory of the entire UFO mythos of uh, disinformation yeah. and uh, intelligence agencies and uh, even other countries using the UFO topic for a certain purpose. Um, we know now through documents, like official uh, FOIA release documents, that Russia back in the 50s and 60s were sending people to America um, to go to like ufo conferences or to go out to like joshua tree where these big uh ufo events were taking place in the desert with all these people claiming that they were talking to aliens and stuff and like mining people for information or going to like these ufo events and hearing uh, americans talk about the most advanced aircraft we had in america at the time and what these ufos did and didn't do and being like we could use this to our advantage um for disinformation purposes. 
So with this whole Benowitz affair, this was our own government doing it on one of their own. This guy claimed that Mm -hmm. UFOs are being seen over Kirtland Air Force Base out in New Mexico. And he also claimed that he was receiving these weird transmissions through his radio. Um, He lived right next door to the base. So he goes there and he's like, "Um, what's this? What's going on? And they were like, huh, interesting. Uh, We didn't know that was... That shouldn't make it out of the base, but thank you for telling us. Um, we'll, we'll keep, uh, if you hear anything else, let us know. So what did they do? They hired this guy within the um, the Air Force Office of Special Investigations to befriend this guy, Benowitz, and to start feeding him all of this, uh, what is claimed to be uh, fabricated stories, that these transmissions he was getting were from an alien race that were coming to invade the planet. But they wanted to give certain people full warning so that they could prepare for it and um, all this crazy stuff, Hmm. man. They would uh, every day when he wasn't home, they'd break into his house and like move a vase of flowers to the other table or just move his couch a couple inches the other way. So it literally all these small things started to drive this guy insane. And what we came to find out, these transmissions he was receiving were actually the most cryptic, top secret uh, coded messages within the intelligence agencies during the Cold War. So the fact that this guy next door to the base was not only hearing them, but being able to decode them meant that they had a huge security breach. And what did they do? They drove this guy insane with all this alien bullshit to make sure that if he ever did tell anyone about these codes he broke, that he would go out and say it was aliens. So they hired a guy to drive this guy insane. And he eventually ended up committing suicide because of all this. Oh, and um, this so shows terrible. the lengths that the, uh, you know, the intelligence agencies will go um, when it comes to like counterintelligence and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So it's pretty crazy. This is all documented, mind you. Yeah, no, that's an interesting documentary. Stuff. They interview the guy that, and they... They they're upfront about it, what they did. And so, yeah, it just, it's like another angle to this whole thing. Like is some of this or all of this, or, you know, maybe a little bit of this, is it disinformation that they're doing? Cause it's just, it's, it's so bizarre. I mean, you know, it's just, I think people want to know that they want answers. And so hopefully we'll get those soon. It sounds like we're getting more and more information now. These, some of these videos are coming out from the military. That's big that they finally ad- admitted that there is UFOs and they're trying to investigate them. It's a huge step, man. Again, we haven't had this for 70 plus years since the Roswell cover-up. And um, this topic has been made fun of, laughed at, uh, the stigma and ridicule attached. Like, I can't tell you how many, like, first dates I went on. And when I told the girl I was a ufologist, like, I never heard from them again. So, like, (laughs) it's real, dude. Like, people think I'm crazy. People think that I'm, you know, an adult refusing to grow up and believe in all this flying saucer stuff but look i've got right here literally the official report by the office of um national security and the department of defense that came out last week uh saying ufos are real and they remain unexplained we looked at 144 cases we explained one one case so you're right that's crazy our our government is acknowledging the phenomenon they're saying it's real Um, We want our military to report it if they see it, which is not something they've ever done before. Mm. There's a reason Kevin Day didn't talk about it with the Nimitz event. There's a reason pilots don't come forward. Most of them never fly again after they report a UFO. Um, So things are changing. Our Mm. government is saying this is real. It could pose a threat. We need to know about it. Um, So look, it's a new age of acknowledgement. Um, UFOs are real. There's no arguing that any longer, but that's where, but then we, yeah, we just don't know because I mean, the, I mean, if you look at the definition, it's an unidentified flying object. So it's just like unidentified. We don't know what it is. It doesn't necessarily saying that it's aliens could be interdimensional, could be other countries, could be holograms, like I said, or some sort of weird technology, who knows, but either way, it's fascinating. It's fascinating (laughs) stuff to me. So I appreciate you doing this uh, interview. This was a lot of fun. Uh, People should definitely, again, check out your book, Somewhere in the Skies, the podcast of the same name. I've listened to a lot of episodes. It's great stuff. Watch your shows, uh, Mysteries Decoded, I believe it's called. You're on two episodes of that. It's great. 
uh, and I look forward to more stuff. So um, I'd like to end each episode with a charity. Is there is there a charity or something that people can donate to? Oh, I love that, man. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I donate to one here in New York City. I work with them and volunteer often as well. Uh, it's called the Women's Refugee Commission um, okay. to help, uh, you know, displace refugees, uh, primarily women, um, in getting the resources they need to uh, survive as a refugee in America. So um, I love it. I, um, I highly suggest people check them out. Okay. I'll put that link in the notes along with um, what's the best way for people to reach you. Cause I don't think you have a website. Should I send people to YouTube or Facebook or what's. I, I do have a website. Actually. Oh, you do. Okay. Um, yeah. Brand new spanking new. Oh, okay. it's, it's gorgeous. I got um, an awesome designer. It's just somewhere in the skies.com. Dot com. Okay. I'll put that in the yeah. notes. That's easy. And um, yeah, I mean like one of the things that you say at the end of your book you have an inkling that there's more to this. So I like that. Um, I don't know. Quick plug for my dad. My dad wrote a book. It's actually called Ultimate Reality. You might like it. It's really oh, interesting. Wow. So it's about just like, you know, where we, where do we come from? Where are we going? What is our purpose? And, and he explored his 500 resources about just everything like, and he doesn't take a certain angle. And I, when I asked him at the end of like, so, you know, what is your answer to this? He's like, I don't know. You know, I just know there is some other alternate reality. I don't know what it is, but I know there's something out there. So it's an, it's an interesting okay. book to check out if you're, if, you, if people are interested in that too. So. Absolutely. I'm going to check it out for sure. I, I have a feeling me and your dad have a lot more in common. Than, yeah. Uh, I interviewed my stuff. dad. You could check out the podcast too. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting stuff. It's a lot of deep top topics that I think crisscross with the whole UFO and alien stuff. Absolutely, man. And yeah. I just want to tell you too, Big fan of the work you do. Thank I, you. I love, I listen to um, your Less Than Jake, your Lit episode, your Everclear episode. So no, thank you for what you're doing. And hey, thanks for taking a chance on a UFO guy. Yeah. I think you've opened the door to a lot of new conversations. Yeah. On the show. This was a lot of fun. I want to definitely have more. I'll have you back on again. So thanks. All right. Really thanks, Ryan. That. I'll see you later. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, my mind is blown. How about yours? This is a lot of information to take in. Uh, but if you want to continue down the rabbit hole, I suggest getting uh, Ryan's book. Again, it's called Somewhere in the Skies. There it is right here. And Or you can check out the podcast. It's the same name. Uh, both will go into uh, much more detail than we did here and are really fascinating, in my opinion. I find the whole topic really interesting. Uh, and you can also check out Ryan's episodes of Mysteries Decoded on the CW. Uh, we got them on demand for free, and some of his other TV shows are on there for free as well. Um, all really great stuff. Make sure to check out his website, somewhereintheskies.com. It's in the show notes. And make sure to follow Ryan on social media. And if you want to support my show, uh, the website is also in the show notes as well. And you can check out some of the other episodes that I have. You might enjoy uh, the Jay Dyer episode or Dr. Lee Meller and uh, the episode with my dad, uh, author Roger Shoot, And he has a book as well called Ultimate Reality that's really interesting. And make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you listen so you don't miss any future episodes. And remember, your follows, likes, comments, and shares on social media help me out a lot. So I really appreciate that and all your support. If you want to go the extra mile, you can write me a review wherever you listen. Uh, but thank you for sticking with us. Have a great rest of your day. And remember to shoot for the moon.